now I want to introduce our next three panelists, experts and guests on the stage. Here you see Bob Balch. Bob is an uh, agricultural development economist working on poverty dynamics, household service and food price analysis. He is a leading economist at RMIT University in Vietnam. Welcome, Bob. And next to him, Katarina Katja Mikaelova from University of Zurich. No, sorry, is Abby. <laughs> You are in the wrong order. <laughs> Shame. <laughs> but I can change. Abby Riddell, welcome also you. An educational planner. She has been involved professionally in education and development for over 30 years. Currently a freelance. Previously as aid effectiveness advisor in the Ministry of Education, Youth and Sport in Cambodia. And before that as a senior program specialist at UNESCO in Paris. Welcome, Abby. And then <laughs> we have Katarina Katja Mikhailova from the University of Zurich. Uh, Katja is a professor of political economy and development at the University of Zurich and also worked with the OECD on education and Africa. Welcome all three of you. We will talk about education and aid, but first start with Bob. Bob, is social sector aid focused on the poorest and most deprived countries, would you say? Okay. Well, thank, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, on the whole, I would say that social sector aid and aid in general is not focused on the poorest and most, most deprived countries. Um, we saw in Miguel's earlier presentation how there's been a big rise um, in aid uh, and also that the share of social sector spending in aid has also risen from about a fifth in 1990, 1991 to a little bit over a third, 35, 36% today. But the big question, as you say, is how much of this aid goes to the poorest and most deprived countries. In the paper which um, we've prepared for this conference, um, we looked at that issue and came up with four key findings using the latest available data um, on poverty, aid flows, mal malnutrition, under five mortality, also the number of children who are out of primary school um, yeah. to as assess those different dimensions of poverty and deprivation. And we came up with these four main findings. Um, firstly, that the overall allocation of aid, what's called net official development, assistance um, is broadly neutral. It doesn't favour either the poorest and most deprived or the richest countries. You know, it's broadly fairly evenly sp spread with a slight bias towards the poorer countries. And that is, is mirrored in our second point by set, uh, aid to the social sectors, which is also broadly neutral. We do, however, find that there are significant contrasts between the multilateral donors, these are the big international organizations such as the World Bank and the IMF and the European Union. So what do you see there? What, what uh, is the difference? There, there, there we see more focus on the poorest and more deprived countries relative to the bilateral donors, which are the individual countries uh, making, direct making direct allocations to developing countries. So this would be Swedish aid or the United States or these sorts whose aid tends to be um, a little bit more regressive. So there's a big contrast there. And, and why is that so? I mean, I suppose that it should go to the poorest and most deprived mm -hmm. countries. That's the best way mm -hmm. to do it. And first of all, why doesn't it go there? Mm -hmm. And second of all, why is there such a big difference in those two uh, ways of challenging aid, mm -hmm. do you think? I think, I think there's two reasons. Um, the first is that there are traditional mm. historical ties, if you like, between particular bilateral donors and particular countries. These are, could be former, former colonies or countries with whom donors have had 
uh, special interests for a long time, or they could simply be countries where they've had aid programs for a long time. But aid is, if you like, a bit like an oil tanker, in the sense that it takes an awfully long time to turn it around. Once things get going, it tends to continue in that direction for quite a long time. The multilaterals are a little bit more, um, shall we say... Small ships. Uh, well, they're, they're a little bit smaller, but they're also a little bit nimbler in, in kind of na you know, navigating Navigation. their way around the sea. I think the other issue, which actually is, is the fourth point there, is actually what the composition of aid is, particularly within the social sectors. And what we found here was that the distribution of aid to health and population, we combine those, those, those two together, um, is typically quite a bit more progressive targeted towards the poorest countries than aid, toward aid to education or other aid to the social sectors, which would include uh, water, which we talked, talked about before, also social infrastructure, also quite a bit of aid to governance, something like 30% of all aid to the social sectors is actually going towards governance, which is something which people maybe don't always equate with the social sectors. Mm. And when it comes to education, could you say, because we are going to discuss education mm -hmm. later on, can you say something more about that, what aid looks like there overall? Well, I can do. It would be, it would be helpful if I give you just a little bit of background to what an aid okay. concentration curve is, and then I'll skip to telling you about aid, aid concentration curves for education, if I may. So, uh, with apologies if this diagram seems a little bit confusing, this is actually an example of an aid concentration curve. What it does is it plots the cumulative percentage of aid, this is actually social sector aid, uh, for all bilateral donors from the Development Assistance Committee in this graph. And the cumulative share of that on the vertical axis is plotted against the cumulative share of some measure of poverty and deprivation. The one we've used here is the standard World Bank one of people living on under two dollars a day. So in what does it power, actually say? Parity terms. Well, if an aid concentration curve crosses that diagonal 45 degree line, yeah. that shows you that aid is being targeted towards the poorest countries, whereas if it's below the line, it shows that aid is more aggressive and is going to higher middle, middle income countries, that sort of thing. Now, one thing I would like to uh, draw people's attention to here is the contrast one has between different countries on this graph. So India, on most aid concentration curves, because they have such a large population, such a large number of poor people, mm -hmm. India accounts for about 36% of the moderately poor people in the world, but it receives about 5% of all bilateral aid. So it has this long, flat segment. Mm -hmm. Now go a little bit further up, and there is the uh, segment Iraq. for Iraq, which is almost vertical. Uh, Iraq actually received more aid, about 5% um, of, of total aid, but only has about a quarter of 1% of the moderately poor people in the world. So it's clear from this type of diagram, we can also identify other countries and we can also identify lower income countries, lower middle income countries and upper middle, un middle income countries um, on this graph. But it's clear that aid is not being distributed um, accord according to the pattern of need as will be indicated by moderate poverty, living, li living below $2 a day. And in our paper, we go through another number of different measures. I won't talk about these now, but I think you have uh, malnutrition. Um, we, also, we also have uh, children out of school uh, for different sectors. But just going to the point on education, what we've also done is construct aid concentration curves for the four big bilateral donors, um, which are Germany, Japan, the UK, and the USA, and then see how their spending uh, relates to the poorest and the richest countries. As you can see from this diagram, the UK actually does quite well in terms of aid for education. Which, which color? Uh, the, the UK is green. Oh, yeah, right. Um, uh, 
and uh, mm -hmm. the USA also does, re do does reasonably well there, whereas um, Germany and Japan, they are spending a lot more money in middle-income, upper-middle-income countries relative to the money which, for example, uh, the UK would spend in poor countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. And so that is what leads to this different distribution of aid by these countries. So what do you think can be done so aid, more aid goes to the poorest and most need, people in need? I think, I think the first thing is that donors actually just need to start being uh, more honest and more transparent about where they are actually, sp a actually, actually spending their aid. Secondly, we need to recognize, um, as I mentioned earlier, that aid is a bit like an oil tanker. It takes, takes some time to reform and turn things around. So we can't expect these things to happen immediately. But certainly if we think about the post-MDG uh, post-2015 agenda, if we can start thinking about some of those things and how to monitor the, these things better, uh, how, to, how to make aid allocations more transparent, how to hold um, governments more, more, more accountable so they actually do what they say they're going to do, uh, we can start to set, set the framework in mind. Mm. Katya, some remarks on this before you start on? Um, I get. I, I think actually we're going to get to a couple of uh, yeah. points where I can point back to what you said. For instance, uh, the way uh, donors, well, uh, tend to allocate aid sometimes, uh, maybe also um, due to, well, different incentives to different countries. Like, I mean, you didn't when 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 Sharon asked about why would multilaterals spend aid differently than bilaterals, I. I, I thought of, the, of it more from within education, like when would they spend more on tertiary rather than on primary, etc. But, um, but I think I'll, I'll perhaps get to some, some additional answers on, on that when we, when we go yeah, on. Yeah, because Katya, <laughs> you have actually studied how, work, uh, how aid works for education. So what can you say um, about this? Did aid help kids to go to school, actually? So actually, this is a first glance of... of uh, aid on, on the red lines and, uh, and the blue lines show you the enrollment rates for different regions in, in the world. And uh, I think at a first glance that, that's some kind of good news for aid in terms of quantity. On the upper parts, well actually the enrollment rates, primary enrollment rates haven't changed much, but they're already pretty high to start off with. And in the lower parts, uh, South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, and North African region, there you basically see the two lines trending together. So this could be a pure trend, but it's already good news to see that it's not kind of the opposite direction because that would make us feel um, <laughs> that there could be a problem. Um, so I guess it's, it's, uh, it's not too bad news from this first picture. Um, whereas, of course, we also see already from the, from the top uh, left uh, chart that there are countries where a lot of spending has been done also at least in terms of primary education quantity, there wasn't much to change. So that also already gives us an idea that probably not everything is about quantity or that also there could be inefficiencies uh, by, as you said, maybe spending on the wrong countries. If you want to spend money, uh, if you want to focus on primary education, and this is what all these MDG2 um, education for all was primarily about. So if, if this is really the international community's key objective, then of course you should not expect these kind of things to happen because mm -hmm. then the key objective should be primary enrollment and then you should probably go for these lower region <laughs> countries oh, yeah. where you have something to improve. So I, I, so I think this is one of the first points where we get together in some way, right? Mm -hmm. So what worked? Yeah, yeah this, is, this is one slide I showed and this is now getting back to actually things that have been said in the first panel here yeah. about complementarities because this is also something we found. Um, I looked at different types of educational spending. For instance, spending on infrastructure and spending on training. Spending on primary education and spending on secondary education. And as it turns out, for, for some of these um, categories like training versus infrastructure, actually the data are not so sharply distinguishable, so it's more difficult to establish these complementarities. 
But for primary and secondary education, it actually came out pretty clearly. At least now that for most countries, sec uh, primary education is already at, at quite some level. I mean, we saw, I think in Miguel's or in Finn's charts, I don't remember so well anymore, that, that nowadays we already have reached quite something in terms of overall primary enrollment. So nowadays you have to keep thinking about what's going on after that. And what this graph here shows, I can't point at it, but you see the increasing line. Mm -hmm. And on the lower uh, axis you have aid for secondary education, and on the y-axis you have um, the effect of aid on primary education. And actually what this graph shows is um, that um, well, it's only for some spending on secondary education that also spending on primary education now still is effective. So you have to have a combination of the two uh, to make it work. And you could um, draw this chart the other way around. If you spend a lot of secondary education, but you have no primary education, uh, no basis for that, mm. of course, your aid on secondary education also won't work. So these things, I mean, you have to look at where a country stands, and then at some appropriate point of time, think further. And I think this was one of the key, um, uh, of the key elements of wh where we thought things might work. There is one very tricky issue in the same context. Um, I thought, well, maybe secondary education provides you an, an incentive to go to for, uh, primary education in the first place because you feel, well, then I can go on, I have some perspective, I can get a good job later on. But then I was wondering, how, how will this move on in the future? Yeah. Maybe at some point secondary education will be saturated as well, then everyone will want to move into tertiary education. Um, and then what? If we don't have the jobs, if we don't have yeah. a simultaneous labor market development, or, and, and that was one of the things I was a bit concerned about, there's also a lot of aid going into vocational training. And you could think it should have the same effect, like secondary education. It should be some, somewhere people can go after that with yeah. their primary education and then move on and find some appropriate job for the economy later on. And that is something we don't see. So oh, I really? found that a little concerning, yeah. So what happens then with voc vocational trained people? I there don't are know. no jobs. At l well, I, I don't know that because we haven't looked at, at the effect on the labor market, uh, but, but at least it doesn't seem to generate for the moment these kind of uh, complementarities between different types of aid, which for me was a concern and for me might mean that, that people in these countries still don't really see the vocational part of the economy as something they want to go to. It's maybe not incentivizing enough. So you know how many that people have enrolled and for, for, for primary education especially, but do we know if they learn anything or what the quality of education is? Um, I have these charts and I, I think uh, our uh, minister from Rwanda will be very happy to, to see the chart because Rwanda is on the top left and it's actually the one example out of that chart which uh, has a very positive outcome. This chart shows again on the, on the um, x-axis the number of years in school and on the y-axis um, the share of people um, who have been asked in household surveys um, about whether they can read and write. It's actually just a matter of reading three, four little sentences. And you have two different ways of testing that, and that's why we have two lines, uh, which don't always give exactly the same results. And I've drawn these little uh, dotted lines um, where approximately um, you have uh, the end of primary education. So you would usually want people even after three, four years after they leave primary education, when they have gone through a full cycle to be able to read at least three, four simple sentences. And in Rwanda, that happens. I mean, those guys who have gone through six years of education, um, they actually pretty much at 100% being able to do so. Whereas you see for Senegal, right next to it, um, that the share after five to six years of, of uh, of education, a, a couple of years later asked in these household surveys, um, they only get to, what is that, 50, 60 percent or something to be able to do so. And for Chad, it's even worse. And also for Kenya, it's not that splendid. 
Um, so you, 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 you see that there is a problem, there's actually a big problem, and there is a lot of variety between countries. I drew this chart from a dissertation in Dijon, there are more countries in there. Um, so she, this girl took the trouble to go through all these household surveys and, <laughs> and create yeah. these different charts. But uh, these are just some examples, and they are not, I mean, I didn't choose the, the worst once. But so do you think they don't learn from each other? Like um, Senegal doesn't learn from the Rwanda example how to make it well? Or um, There's very little learning going on across countries and, and, and it's very difficult also. Yeah. I mean, of course, they come from different backgrounds and the education systems it's are different. structured a lot um, according to colonial history and stuff like that. So there's a lot of difference in how they are structured. And Rwanda, of course, is again a very special case. So, so what did you find the most unexpected here in, in, in your survey? Um, in, in fact, uh, for both quality as well, we found when we tried to analyze that, with it, which is more difficult because they're not such good data. I mean, even for, for, for enrollment, the data are not that great. But for, for, uh, for quality, having comparable data is a challenge in Africa. Um, but we did some analysis in this context, and, and we found similar things, that there, again, there might be complementarities. There, again, there seems to be like an incentive to do well in primary education if you have uh, well, an outlook onto secondary, etc. So, so th these things were similar. But then, when you look at how aid is actually, ooh, how aid is actually distributed, and now we get to <laughs> to the tertiary versus primary issue. Now, look at, at at the lines here. What would you imagine what the top line is? If you can't read it, we could actually make this test with the with the voting here. <laughs> you have to vote by arms. <laughs> having having um, education for all and uh, MDG2, etc. Wouldn't you think that um, primary education should be the top line on, of all these eight categories going into education? And guess what it is? It's actually tertiary education. Oh, really? <gasps> um, so, so that's kind of a surprise. Then the, the following line, the, the dark blue one, is primary education. And then secondary education, of which I sh just showed that it's so important now as kind of the second step to follow the primary education, um, where we should think that now maybe we would invest more into that. That's the pink line. So that's very much at, down at the bottom. Okay. So, um, again, one would wonder, what are the incentives? Why do donors put so much money into tertiary while they all say um, they want to promote primary education? And I think there is an incentive issue here. You want to train the diplomats you are going to talk to later. Um, even within the countries, I think there are incentives um, to have, well, the elite well-trained who is going to support the government, etc. Interesting. Thank you. Abby, you are going to talk about major challenges in education, and we just heard there are some. What do you think is the greatest challenge to education? Well, I've picked out six, and I think this is a really good starting point, together with you know, the previous presenters, in terms of the things that I would like to emphasize. This chart is a really good example of flavors of the month by donors, and the lack of systemic support for an education system. So if you look at tertiary education, indeed, on the left-hand side, hey, whatever happened? And yet, they were trying to you know, uh, provide support to primary education in the old days. But if they didn't present, uh, br uh, produce any teachers, and secondary education was so denuded, well, isn't it interesting that quality is so poor? Yeah. So Rwanda gets you know, full marks for having done well. I go back to my first experience at what I would call the first EFA, <clears throat> which was in Africa in Zimbabwe. And over two years, you, know, you raised you know, the, the, the kind of enrollment levels that we've seen after MDGs. Five years after independence, a third of the schools that had been built in those first few years were denuded because parents sent their kids elsewhere. They knew that the quality was so low. Just like what was said earlier, if you listen to the people and you're actually modeling your support on what their needs are rather than what you're writing about in your book for your accountability and doing the research that you need because it's actually contingent upon the donor support that you're giving, you get a very different picture. And those are some of the challenges that I would like to you know, present that have to do not so much with the problem of aid and donors and recipients, but the donors themselves. It was also raised this morning about coordination amongst donors. 
I remember addressing, and I think it was the year 2000, the International Working Group on Education, which is the group of all major donors to education in the world. And I said to them, and this was, you know, really at the very beginning of the new aid modalities when swaps and budget support were just coming out, I said, what would it take you as a donor to tell another donor that what they were doing wasn't, you know, supportive of the commitments that they had made in the swap? Jump ahead to 2005 and the Paris Declaration. What have we seen in terms of the actual realization of those commitments? So, yeah, we can talk about budget support not having been the answer, but did we even try it? Did we right. actually get the coordination? Okay, I'm talking you know, about aid effectiveness. Let me go back now to what are the challenges to um, uh, education aid? The two big, if, oh, sorry, it's me, <laughs> sorry. Um, the two big issues are quality and sustainability, both of which we've talked about. We talked about sustainability in the previous uh, session, and these are really the words. Let me just uh, pick apart uh, those in some ways. The first thing, and this was also raised uh, earlier this morning, the superimposition of donor projects, even when there exist national education development plans, and even when they do accord with the goals, given the different accountabilities. So you come along and you say, there's your plan. OK, I'll support you know, textbooks in this region. Another donor comes along. You need a teacher training institute over here. Well, it's like support from malaria, you know, the skewed aid budget. What happens to the bits that don't get supported? What is the Minister of Education to do when that happens? Lack of coordination, lack of alignment, lack of harmonization, all the things that the donors in 2005 signed up to that were not realized. And I say that as somebody who held the flag up as the swap lady in many countries, you know, at the very beginning uh, with 25 million pounds in my pocket in 1998 in Zambia, where we had one of the first education swaps following indeed the uh, you know, health basket funding. I used to use the term pool rather than basket for one good reason. And this maybe is partly the difference between health and education. In a pool, if you pour money in, you can't distinguish the bottles. In a basket, like a picnic basket, you can have a bottle of wine next to a bottle of apple juice. And that's part of the problem that I'm also going to raise about even what happens when you do get that level of coordination. It's having those separate bottles, and you want to know whether they're half full or half uh, you empty. Know, empty. Yeah. Nearly half of all ODA to education is still in project form, notwithstanding raising the flag for all the new aid modalities. Donors are still very worried about whether their monies are being well spent. We've also talked already about the short time span to achieve impact when we all know that education change and impact is generation generational. And related to that, something that has certainly been emphasized in the social sectors is the mobility of the staff and personnel that donor agencies have on the ground. You know, I know as having, you know, had many hats that I've worn in my, you know, 30 odd years, you know, as a donor, as an academic, as a UN, you know, uh, professional, whatever, that, you know, you just get to know a place and then, you know, you're out. And part of the problem, as you have mobility and also the deprofessionalization of those that are in country, is the fact that you're then having as an institution to create best practices that you can export from one country to the other because you don't have the time to develop and mentor the expertise that you need to ensure that the programs that you are supporting are the right ones for that country. I'm actually sick to death of the word best practice because what we really don't know is sufficiently a the necessary contextualization, and I don't just mean whether they have six or seven years of primary education or whether, you know, the ethnic groups in one corner of the country are not being included, but something that is much more indigenous and much more representative of the other thing that came out this morning, which was national leadership and ownership mm -hmm. of those development plans. But sure enough, you can have a development plan, but if it's not something that, you know, the nationals actually believe in and rather is something that is a tick box that is necessary as indeed the, you know, uh, a global program on education, what used to be called the FTI, is touted as the most aid effective and yet um, uh, they have a three-year timeline which really limits what you're able to do. Other challenges 
um, besides those timeline uh, systemic uh, uh, projects and so forth, is the, the, the focus on quantitative indicators, enrollments and access with insufficient attention given to quality. This was what happened when you know the EFA became the MDG. I'm sorry, but there's a yeah. story to be told about what happened. You know, in the you know discussions of how and, the MDGs. And please explain what EFA and I'm MDG sorry, is education for Education for all came out of well, actually going back you know, 20 years, but in 2000, there was in Dakar a big, um, you know, grouping of, you know, all the, you know, countries and donors that said, you know, we want not just primary education for all, but a quality education for all, with all of the bells and whistles of what an education system needs. What happened with the Millennium Development Goals was a real you know, a narrowing of that to primary education, and then the donors got onto the bandwagon and moved, okay, enrollments, let's see impact. And what we have are real achievements, I wouldn't deny that, but we're also having to focus now rather belatedly on the quality that wasn't provided at the same time. Now, and this is in my next uh, uh, point on the slide, we're looking at quality, but as determined and measured by agency. Please note, I say represented perhaps by superimposed goals and maybe lip service that is paid to genuine dialogue with recipients. My greatest worry, to be frank, is that we've replaced measuring learning achievement by our agencies that are going out to countries with our, as we said earlier, yeah. our companies that are being supported by our aid monies, superimposing on you know, poor examinations branches that may have one or two people that have the capacity to develop their own exams and of course say yes because the money is riding on it. Are they given the uh, 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 support necessary to develop the sustainable, I, uh, I make the uh, point, capacities to develop their own examinations that they do need without any question. I'm not belittling the need for learning achievement. Please don't misunderstand me. but. The donor relationship is clouding yet another important area. Teachers' training, status, and salaries. Uh, many of you may have read about the use of contract teachers and indeed many of the randomized control trials that have shown that contract teachers work. Again, one country's needs will be very different from another. You know, where you have inflated salaries and teachers are on more than a living wage, it's a different issue from where teachers cannot be expected to be in the classroom because they can't keep bread on the table for their families. So surprise, surprise that many of the teacher um, uh, methodologies that are being taught just go out the back door because either the teacher isn't there or they don't have the time to even implement them. So are we paying lip service to the quality that is needed? I think so. And then this is a real, um, a, a radical statement on my part, the final one about um, uh, challenges to education. Inappropriate use of evidence within the policy framework. It's superimposition without genuine local ownership. I am also sick to death of having research or monitoring and evaluation that is totally part and parcel of the aid program where you know, one of us will be employed to go out and set up a research project and we have maybe you know, lip service paid to the enumerators that are on the ground to actually collect the data and translate into the language what needs to be done. You go back, you analyze it you know, in your office, you then come back and it may be something that's over three to five years and you show wonderful results, the Minister of Education sits around the room and he tells you, well, that's great. And then you try to get some kind of a dialogue of what that would mean to implement the policy in a sustainable way when the donor funds aren't there and there's silence in the room. And why is there silence in the room? Because again, this is something that is showing impact, but for whom? And with what kind of ownership and what kind of analysis that is really being done by those who need to go through that kind of level of capacity development that actually brings about the sustained capacities to determine what the priorities are rather than respond to what is on a plate of options that donors bring to the table. I'm gonna jump ahead because although I have a lot to say about um, um, what we have learned about what works and what doesn't work, I think it can be encapsulated very much in the kinds of changes that need to come about in an aid system that, not myself, but as a kind of, um, it's on two slides, 
I hope you can read this. Um, uh, interesting research that was done, uh, it's called Time to Listen, Hearing People on the Receiving End of International Aid. It was done a few years ago. If you look on the left-hand side, I think it fairly well describes the aid system as we know it. It's entitled Externally Driven Aid Delivery System. And on the other side is aid as some of us who are old and jaded and really frustrated that things keep going the same way and many of our young, you know, things that we're training keep asking us questions that we answered 30 years ago, but because they don't even have the history of what had gone before, no less the experience of implementing them, something that we call collaborative aid system. So if you look on the left and you see local people seen as beneficiaries and aid recipients, and you look on the right and you see Local people seen as colleagues and drivers of their own development. I think this reads a lot into what you were saying uh, you know, earlier about water and sanitation. It says the same thing about education and health, but I think, you know, as you said to me, Katya, everybody, and this is the thing about education, feels that they know what's best about education. So you know, they come out on the plane and they say, this is what you need to do, very much like if I can be an incendiary, Michael Gove is trying to do in you know, my country, the UK right now. Evidence-based policy making, where's the research behind it? Let's learn that lesson before we start you know, doing the same around the world, thinking that it goes like that. Focus on identifying needs, focus on rather supporting and reinforcing capacities and identifying what those local priorities, like the story that um, you know, Dr. Buta you know, made about no health expenditure. Well, actually, we dug a well because they knew what they wanted. Same goes for education. You've got a lot on the slides there that you can refer to. Um, I will only just quickly say capacity development is the biggest blind spot, not for lack of funding, but the, la uh, the blind spot in, in terms of the challenge to uh, you know, aid to education. It shouldn't be seen as a collateral objective, a gap filler, a preliminary, something that is done for individuals. It has to be systemic, it has to be nationally led, it has to be long term, it cannot be you know, the way it has been done, we need to criticize ourselves, those of us, and myself, I've you know, had every hat worn in training people in ministries of education as an academic, as a project you know, supervisor, what, as a donor, whatever. In, I'm going to give you one quote that comes from a review of a huge amount of USAID you know, uh, 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 education projects. In the rush to scale up in a cost-effective way, there is a tendency to look for a formula instead of recognizing that the human process of developing ownership, strengthening new behaviors, and changing systems is done at province by province, district by district, and school by school levels. Let's have a little humility and show that those who really are to be changed have a few ideas themselves rather than getting off the plane and trying to teach them you know, how, how, what their grandmother knows of how to suck eggs. Thank, Thank you. you, Abby. <laughs> There is a lot of frustration out there. Yes. Yes. <laughs> now, um, we have like 15 minutes for some comments. We'll start on the stage with comments. If you have comments here or there, please raise your hands and you will get a microphone. And this gentleman here, well, wait, sit. you can stay sitting because I will start with Katya and Bob. Yes, Katya. Um, I, I think one of these um, serious challenges we have been trying to sort out now for the last at least two decades, I suppose, is, uh, I mean, when, when we want to have these collaborative aid efforts, uh, I mean, it's, it's easy to say that, and it's easy to have that with a country which shares the same opinion yeah. than those who want to come in the country and help um, from the outside. Um, and then, of course, there is this whole issue about the donors themselves not having the same interests and the same ideas, etc. But even leaving that apart, and 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 just looking at the well, the the, the government side itself, um, it's kind of complex. I mean. I mean, of course, you're aware of that, I'm sure, but I still want to put up the point. Um, for instance, when you get, we, we once got the, 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 uh, into a discussion with the Cameroonian um, education minister, and it was an issue um, about basically, um, well, 
whom education in the country and whom education spending um, should be allocated to. And the issue was about quality, and uh, the idea was that, well, the country might be spending too much on, on those uh, in schools within the capital or the bigger cities who anyway were basically catering to the richer kids. Um, and then the response was, well, when we, of, of the Cameroonian minister, when we were young, uh, we were sent into the woods and only the, uh, the best survived. Huh? Saying, well, I mean, um, um, well, we focus on those um, who have something and, um, well, let's see for the rest. I mean, yeah, if you get these kind of <gasps> responses, then what do you do? Don't you invest in aid in Cameroon because you think it's anyway, I mean, you, you won't get to a collaboration with this kind of people? Or um, do you still go for it? And then obviously it'll be donor driven. Um, and I think this is, this is an issue we still haven't sorted out really, how to, how to go about this. Bob. Um, just one, one reflection from what Abby and I were talking about o over coffee, um, which was that there is a, a contrast between how budgetary support and swaps have worked in some countries which have very strong governments. I'm particularly uh, thinking, of, thinking of a country where I've worked for a long time and work now, Vietnam, where if you have a strong government which is very proactive and is prepared to tell donors very clearly what they want and yeah. to reject certain things, how that can lead to a much more cohesive system. I think there's a couple of things which um, are important here. I've mentioned that they need to be government-led, needs to have active participation of both local and national NGOs to add a sense of um, perspective. They need to meet on a regular, on a regular basis. Um, the, the former minister from uh, Rwanda said, you know, they met once a year. Well, I've said that, you know, uh, meeting of these sector support groups at least quarterly and preferably more than that will be necessary to meet, meet a genuine understanding. And that can also contribute to um, selectivity in terms of a number of donors. One of the great pro problems with aid is that it is extremely fragmented. Uh, every donor wants to have a, be doing something in every sector in nearly every country. Uh, if a, a substantial commitment in both time and money is required to a sector support group, that can often uh, make donors think twice about whether we really want to become involved in sector X in country Y. Thank you. I really want to let uh, the floor in. So where are the microphones now? One and where is the other microphone? There. So I start with you and then you. Oh, I would take, wow. We take three comments. One, two. And um, oh, well, we, we, we try all five of them. Let's start. We'll see what we get. Okay, yes. of course. Short comments or of questions, course, please. Of course, I've got very short comments. Uh, first, my name is Francis Matambalia, and I'm from the Nordic Africa Institute, but I'm Tanzanian also. So um, let me say that um, it's a bit surprising what was presented, I think, is by the lady in green, isn't it? Because I thought that for quite some decades now, uh, primary and secondary education in particular, these are private goods. They're no longer public goods. They don't really enjoy the same kind of attention in terms of support as tertiary education. So I was wondering to which extent, uh, whichever you find in the graphs, is, is more of a coincidence than a reality in the, the many graphs you had there. And of course, I cannot agree less with the, me the lady at the, at, at the middle. I think she said it all in terms of how everything is done nowadays. I think there is a lot of uh, donor decision of everything. They come up, for instance, at the university, they'll come with um, even research themes. And if you want to be considered maybe for a master's degree or PhD degree scholarship in Sweden, you must fit yourself in. And they have decided, they say, okay, you Africa, we think that you need microfinance. You don't need development finance. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll stop there. Okay. Next. There. Thank you. Hello. Hello. My name is Joshua. I live in Stockholm. I have a problem here. I just want to make an allusion to what uh, they just said there. There is always this question about the number of uh, 
uh, enrollment in primary schools in Africa. I think that uh, the, should, the focus should be on the number of, uh, the quality of education yeah. in Africa. I have a problem. I, I just make a perspective of myself. In the early 80s, we had the best primary schools in the rural areas, the best teachers in the rural areas. But as of now, if you go to the primary school in the rural areas, they are all gone, they are all destroyed. There are no trained teachers, they have only PT teachers with first school living certificate. So I tend to doubt where they get the statistics sometime when they talk about education in Africa. She just said about Cameroon, I'm from Cameroon. It's chaos in my homeland. The quality is going down drastically every day. And you know, the highest number of students or whatever, they come from rural areas. And now, there are no primary school teachers. In a, a division of about 10,000 people, you have 10 secondary schools, 50 primary schools. Those are not policies. And how does Dono reflect on these issues? So that is the question. Thank you, uh, an interesting challenge. Um, two more? Who has the microphone? Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Anders Molin and I work with Health here at SIDA. Uh, I think it's really interesting that so much of the discussion so far has been on aid efficiency. Uh, and I have two comments on that. The first one is that um, uh, maybe we should stop having any hopes of the possibility of governments to move forward on aid efficiency because we now see the results so many years after the Paris Declaration and, and behaviors of bilateral donors uh, hasn't really lived up to any of the expectations that we had in the beginning. The only way forward, as it seems, for the, according to the discussion here as well, is increasing national ownership to the point where countries actually say no to money. And then how to do that is another issue. So that's the first. The second one is related, and that is that when it comes to resource transfer to low and middle income countries, I think we need maybe to, um, or I do think that we need to create global mechanisms that can replace bilateral aid. Uh, because it's obvious that from a political reason, governments, donor governments, find it much easier to, to um, uh, that it is the international mechanisms and the multilateral mechanisms that actually uh, follow the Paris uh, and ACRA principles rather than, doing it, than them doing it themselves. Thank you. One last comment and then I want to give... Uh, uh, one, no, we have one last. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. My name is uh, Mikael Viking. I work with the Swedish Mission Council um, Development Corporation organization. Uh, my question is perhaps mostly directed to Katarina and uh, it's uh, a question relating to to a, to a study that came out last year uh, by an Indian social scientist called, called Krishna, and it's written a report called uh, One Illness Away, Why People Become Poor. Uh, in this study, one of the points that he's making is that uh, education is not always, primary education and secondary education, is not always leading to uh, development or to poverty eradication above all. You, you don't see poverty reduction as a result of more people being having uh, education. And I would like to ask you what you have seen in your research and perhaps from the other panelists also what you think about that issue if there is, um, if, if this uh, lack of link between education and poverty eradication actually exists, what do you think about that? Okay, let's see who wants to start. Abby. Okay, well, I'll take um, a bit about uh, global mechanisms. I couldn't agree more, but I mean, the real problem is whether we can actually get agreement that has teeth. You know, unless you have some kind of mutual accountability amongst donors, whether it's in country or whether it's global, you know, in terms of how it's activated. I've tried, I've basically given up. I spent a year as aid effectiveness advisor to the ministry in um, Cambodia, and I've followed in the subsequent year and a half since I've been away what has happened with a lot of you know, the plans that I set afoot, which were to bring in principles of behavior, to try to give more ownership you know, to the government, um, whether on the government side or on the donor side, the government doesn't want to know because basically they don't want to criticize the donors. The donors don't want to know because they don't want to criticize each other. 
I don't know where you go from here. Uh, I don't think it, as we've seen, well, I'm not sure it was in these, yeah, it was in your um, uh, graphs earlier, or, or maybe it was Miguel's, you know, the, in, uh, the percentage that goes into multilateral aid. That's been the easy fix, certainly for DFID, to get rid of the amount of money for the commitment that it's made. Whether that's made the difference, I have a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions over what I described as the necessary best practices when, on the one hand, you're having to spread more money around to more countries with fewer professional staff to decide how that is spent and to look at it. Thank you. Bob. I'd, I'd make two comments to our, our colleague from CEDA. Um, he mentioned about countries sometimes having the courage to say no, no. to aid. I think, that's, I think that's a very good point, but I would turn it slightly around, slight, slightly around and say, say no to aid from particular donors um, or in particular areas. And this is a way that they can make aid more selective and also reduce these problems to do with uh, frag frag fragmentation and burden of aid. The other point I would like to make, which regards general um, aid flows, is that um, with the recent revisions to the OECD classification of countries into low income, lower middle income, and um, upper middle income countries, you now have a large number of formerly low income countries who've just crossed the threshold of one of, of one thousand and fifty dollars uh, per person per year into being lower middle income countries. These countries include places like in India um, and Nigeria and Pakistan where there is a huge amount of poverty and deprivation. And so I think it's in, important for donors not to focus too much purely on the low income countries as they have in the past. They need to either raise, raise, raise the threshold or start to say, well, we need to include some lower, lower middle income countries. Thank you, Bob. Uh, the last remark, <laughs> it actually has to be like a two minutes answer. Uh, just, try it. I just start somewhere. There were so many questions. Yes. I can stop me if I have to. No, you just <laughs> choose something that you can say something well, really maybe interesting. I'll, I'll start with your question. Um, um, your question has been been um, set out even in a prior paper by a World Bank economist Lan Pritches. Where has all the education gone? Is actually the title of his uh, of his um, paper, and uh, he also finds that well, education. Um, can't robustly be shown to lead to growth, can't robustly be shown to lead to poverty reduction and so on. And what's the issue here? I mean, my, um, my um, um, Im impression on the, the interpretation you have to give to that is on the one hand side, of course, again, we have a lot of data problems, that's one thing, but that aside, I think there are a lot of substantive issues behind there too. For instance, some is about the complementarities we were talking about earlier. If you don't have quality looked at at the same time as quantity, you can, for instance, quote the example of Tanzania in the late 70s. They were already at almost 100% uh, gross primary education with a lot of aid by, uh, by foreign donors. Quality was so low um, that even in the country itself, it was not sustainable because, well, st um, the, the kids and the parents didn't know what to do with that education. If they land up in the fields later on again, it's not used for anything. So education levels dropped again. And then labor market development is another thing. As long as you have um, the, the civil service growing after colonization, I mean, you can fill up every secondary school lever into this uh, sector, but that's going to be saturated at some point, and then you need some other area. If that's not developing, where should it go? And then um, you have the issue on um, of, of civil wars in many countries. Of course, you can train people and they use their human capital for very different things. They can actually use it for, um, uh, for activities that are detrimental to the development of the country. So again, there is a lot of question about the setting. Whoop. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katya, Abby. Thank you also, Bob. <laughs> A big applaud. Mm -hmm.